everyone to Pop Cult X episode 141. This week, we're lucky enough to be joined not only by Danny, our co host, <laughs> and myself, Gabriel, um, but we have a special guest co host, Terry Blast, who's going to be uh, sharing his opinion on all things pop culture and also giving us uh, some insight into some of his new work uh, that he's been up to. So, welcome once again, Terry. Thank you. Yay. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's great to have you back, Terry. I think this is like the third or fourth time you've been on the show. So it's really cool to have um, repeat visitors, I guess, to the show to to learn more about them. And then we get to know you more as not just a, a once off interview, but more just like a friend and, you know, part of the show. Listen, any chance to chat about pop culture? <laughs> That's something I consume very heavily. <laughs> Awesome. Right. Yeah. And so speaking of pop culture, we normally or typically we start off the show by getting to what we've been watching, what we've been reading, uh, listening to, etc. So I'll go ahead and get started by what has kind of gotten my attention lately. And that would be X-Men 97 uh, animated show on Disney Plus. Um, I've been able to watch the first two episodes and I'm a big fan. Uh, it kind of picked up where the animated series left off. And um, I'm really happy with the end results so far um the the first two episodes were great um i, I don't want to give any spoilers out for those that haven't watched it but some really cool stuff happened um so with some of my favorite characters of course storm kind of represented uh in a really cool way and um, i don't know that's what i'm excited about so far did you guys get a chance to to watch it I'm not I'm not familiar with this X Men. <laughs> Are you X kidding? What? Yes, I watched it like right when it came out. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, I'm one of those nineties kids that was like, X Men cartoon brought me to comics. Um, but I really liked it. I thought it was really fun. Um yeah, yeah I won't I don't want to spoil anything for anyone either, but I feel like um like the action was was done really well. Yeah. And right. I think that like so much of so much of X-Men tends to focus on just like a couple characters. Like a lot of times they focus on Wolverine or whatever. But the the thing I liked the most was the way they used Morph in action scenes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really cool. So I enjoyed it a lot. I'm excited because I think tomorrow is another episode. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, so for those that didn't watch it, Morph kind of morphs into some other characters or X-Men that make special <clears throat> appearances in the episode and in a really cool action sequence, um, which is a really cool way to show his powers and to show what he's capable of. Um, funny that you mentioned Morph because he's been sort of a lightning rod for controversy, although really hasn't, uh, in the two episodes that aired, there really wasn't anything controversial, but um, apparently they announced that the character will be uh, non-binary and for some reason that's upsetting to some people um oh, who cares you know like <laughs> it, like it, he's a shapeshifter like right yeah. who cares like i just <laughs> like don't don't you, don't you people who are upset about this have anything better to do or worry about like <laughs> like you don't care when you don't care when mystique turns into like a boy and just right. like hides out as a boy like you know, if people were like, Mystique's non-binary, I'm sure people would still freak out. I mean, people, like, I think, okay, I'm just going to say this. I think what's upsetting people is that X-Men 97 is very explicit about, like, the fact that, like, there's basically a January 6th theme. Yeah. And, right? Yeah. And people are all pissed about it. And I'm like, you're upset because it's calling out that you have something in common with people that you don't want to be associated with that you don't want you know but you do um and i just i've been reading so many like not reading so many but i've just seen so many of these like you know x-men's gone woke and this and that and i'm like have you read any of the comics from the 60s <laughs> like any of them like it's always been, like why would you want the x-men to be asleep like they've always been woke <laughs> like i don't i don't get it i don't know the funny thing i did the, like i'm so into it that that there's a scene where more um morphs into a specific character and starts fighting with uh like swords and someone's like um did he morph swords or they morph swords or whatever and i was like literally going like frame by frame and i'm like oh no you can see morph pull like the swords out of the back of like the villains mm -hmm. if you pause it just right <laughs> that's how <laughs> into it i was <laughs> yeah and I've thought about it. Curious about that of like how creators feel about people that pick apart 
their work mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you know oh well on page nine in uh you know you show this character do this and how and you're like well i'm the one that like created the character or i'm the one that wrote the character so i can do whatever i want <laughs> like <laughs> it reminds me of the i think it was stan lee where someone asked him like who would win in a fight between the hulk and wolverine and whatever and he's like whoever the writer wants yeah like yeah. you know i I, <laughs> I think um you know, I grew up in an era where where you had to, like, record a show onto a VHS tape. And then maybe if you paused it just right, you could make out through the blurriness something yeah. you wanted to buy. But, you know, we can scrutinize every frame now. And I think people, you know, we consume shows in such a different way that, like, people who make TV are, I'm sure, highly aware of that fact. So. One of the other things that came out from the show that that I think is kind of the, uh, really cool is they did a really good job, in my opinion, with Cyclops. Um, they showed his powers in a way that was really cool that that I haven't seen before. And um, I think are really, really kind of doing him justice. Whereas before the character is kind of, I don't know, like bland or not as exciting as he could be. Yeah. Um, what are your guys' thoughts about that? Especially in the movies, I think he really was just like a throwaway, at least from in my point of view. He was just he was there. We all knew his powers, especially if we knew the X-Men, but he didn't really stand out in this one. You see him take the um, hesitantly want to take the reins of the X-Men. Right. And I I don't know if we're giving away spoilers and it doesn't really matter. People have. I mean, if you saw the original. Yeah, if you saw the original, you know how it ended. It's just it's a continuation, which I think we should point out of the series from the late 90s. So I think that's really cool to begin with. But um, the way he's taking command, I think, is different than what I've seen from him before, at least in the um, film or animated series. So I like it. I think it's really cool. I I like it, too, because I, I know there are many, many people who like stan cyclops who are like but he's the awesomest and if you don't like him you suck i've never been that big of a cyclops fan but i do think that the way like what they're doing with him in x-men 97 does make me feel like oh yeah this is more interesting this is kind this is kind of cool the way that he's leading and fighting and whatever i think i think it's fun i like it a lot yeah Yeah, uh, the last thing that I kind of wanted to bring up about X-Men 97 that has been guarding a lot of attention is the wardrobe of characters, specifically Gambit when he's like in the kitchen in his prop top shirt. Um, again, it's it's something that like, how could that be controversial? Yet uh, people are arguing about like, why is he dressed like that? Um, I, I tend to like it. I think it's cool. Like he's uh, it, it's of that era and but that's how he dressed in the comics right like when you know like who can't i've seen so many artists draw that i was like oh should i draw this and i was like no i've seen way too many artists now draw that look and yeah it's, it's yeah <laughs> i don't know it, I it's, it's, it's interesting though no, it's like caused a it's caused a whole you know ignited a whole thing yeah and and it's it's really weird because I, I think that it's funny how when you see male characters drawn in, and it's not even like in an overtly sexual way, but just a little bit more like body conscious or showing a little bit more of their body, you know, fanboys like go crazy. But I've seen the most vulgar drawn women in comics that like things that are like insane. I I, I was just watching a video uh, on YouTube of this comic book cover variant that is Mary Jane and I think Black Cat like sprawled on a bed and and all you see is Spider-Man's hand like entering the cover and shooting webbing at certain parts of their body and I was like that's oh, the grossest thing I've ever seen in my life like it's like it's funny <clears throat> it's so obscene and so gross and and I'm like where are all the fanboys like upset about that or like there's like no outrage because we're so used to seeing women objectified like that in comics that when gamut shows his belly people are like oh my god like that's too much like that's crazy well i don't want to generalize but i think i think people quote unquote in this case are mostly dudes right mostly straight dude i don't know many gay dudes who are like i don't like the way gambit's wearing a crap top like come on (laughs) we don't care right but um but i think that I like you know they they don't like that he's being sexualized the way that they do enjoy 
theme, like you said, like that Mary Jane and Black Cat cover or whatever. And like yeah. that tells me so much. There's there's this whole thing I um read once and like it kind of I don't even remember what it was, but it led me to the conclusion that like like basically homophobia is when like a guy is afraid that uh, that like a gay guy is going to treat him the way that he would treat a woman. I've read right. something like that too before, yeah. You know, like if you don't care, like I know plenty of straight guys who watched X Men '97 who were like, "Yeah, whatever, Gambit, cool." Yeah. <laughs> they don't care, right? Like, right? Uh, yeah, just can't you just enjoy like the cool? Like, it's cool, it's fun, it's X Men. Like, I don't understand why people want to. I I wonder if you know people like to say that um, things aren't any worse than they used to be it's just that now we're like have the social media and everyone has a camera and you know and we're just like filming it now and seeing it more and it's like ugh, okay well sometimes i don't need to see it <laughs> i don't want to hear what what people on the internet have to say about <laughs> X-Men 97. yeah it's true um one thing i stood out to me for the 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 series was magneto's flowing hair i guess i was wasn't expecting that <laughs> So it was just there and glorious. I wasn't expecting his look, his like new new outfit. <laughs> I, I loved it. I, I know it's it's a throwback to the comics and mm -hmm. um his like long opera gloves, like I think are awesome. <laughs> you know what I've been wanting to do that I haven't gotten around to yet? There's you know that meme of Wolverine like on the bed with like the picture frame? Yeah. Yeah. And so in X-Men 97, you see a picture in a frame of Magneto and Xavier together. Like, and I want to like Photoshop gotcha. that. Into, into that. <laughs> <laughs> He's just like, oh, yeah. I don't know. I've, like, if I remember correctly, the end of X-Men, the original series, um, I don't think Xavier died. I think Lalandra no. took him away yeah. mm -hmm. to like see if she could save him. Right. Right. So, but they're all like, well, you know, Professor's dead. It's like, is he? <laughs> is he? I don't know. We'll see. Uh, that's just what I love about the X-Men is it's just like a comic soap opera. Like it's just oh, everyone yeah. you know, up with each other. It's drama. And and that's what I, I laugh about people who are who are like new to the X-Men and start complaining about things. It's like wait till you read back issues or wait till you get to know the X-Men better. Like you're really not going to like it if you're not into that sort of stuff. When someone complains, I think you, you can kind of tell if they have read the comics or not. Right. Like, you know, they complain about something you're like, I don't want to be the person that's like, well, actually an issue, whatever, you know what I mean? <laughs> but like, you can tell in the attitude sometimes it's like, Oh, that's what you have an issue with. Like, but, there was an entire run of the X-Men that did that or, you know, so whatever. <laughs> I don't want to gatekeep. If you just like the cartoon and you think it's awesome. Great. But like, yeah. you know, just, in, just enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Totally. So that's what I saw X-Men 97. That's kind of what I was enthralled with uh, this week. What about you guys? Go ahead, Terry. What's on your list? <laughs> how many shows, how many shows do you want to talk about? <laughs> I don't know if you guys talked about this recently, but I did because it's because the original and its sequel series are two of my favorite things in the entire world. I watched the new live action Avatar The Last Airbender series on Netflix. Okay. Um, I don't did you guys see we it? I watched so, the first episode. Yeah, okay. I same. My my husband is is really big fan of the show, and I was sort of forced into watching the first part of it, but it, it's not my thing, so I just kind of didn't pay attention. <clears throat> um, I I enjoyed it. I oh, liked yeah. it. I feel like, and I'll speak in generalization, generalizations, so in case you end up watching more, but I feel like the quality of the show and it's t like, I, I guess the quality kind of dips in and out, right? Yeah. Every time they film in like a practical location in the woods or whatever, it's it feels really cool or like on a set. But I kind of don't like sometimes when they use that volume thing. It feels kind of fake to me. I don't know. But um, I would say that the tone kind of goes in and out too. But in the cartoon, it did. The cartoon has like funny moments and scary moments. And, you know, um, 
I did enjoy it quite a bit. I thought some of the casting was great. Um, the only thing that I don't like, and it's not exclusive to Avatar, <clears throat> is that it only got eight episodes. Mm-hmm. And okay, that you know that's that seems to be a Netflix thing, right? Yeah. You know, we, I, I, of course, I compare everything to Buffy the Vampire Slayer, right? And <laughs> every season of Buffy got like twenty two. We we used to we used to make. Mm-hmm. 22 episode seasons of shows actors are like amazing that gives me work you know people who work on the show the costumers the lighting they're all like yes awesome great and now it's netflix is like mm, how about six <laughs> so so it's hard to get i feel it's hard to get like a full awesome character arc that feels really satisfying when you just have six to eight episodes especially when we've we already know so much about the previous material. Right. Um, yeah. And, and so with that, I'll segue into another Netflix show that I watched uh, all of the past two days, which was the three body problem. Mm, I, heard and I feel like it, it's really interesting. It's really good. I liked it. The, the quality does kind of go in, in terms of some of the writing, but I think the acting's really good. The premise is amazing. Um, but again, like, six or eight episodes and i feel like this show would have been amazing as a week to week show on like hbo you know what i mean where like you can digest what's happening and then come up with your like when despite its last season when game of thrones was on people were like oh but who do you think's going to be this and who's who's doing that and what do you think is going to happen here like that's what i think this show kind of needed because it's <clears throat> without revealing too much, I guess the basic premise is um, like the scientist in China in the sixties figures out that like aliens are on their way (laughs) to us. And that's kind of all I want to say. It's very science. It's very like, you know, there's like a weird virtual reality aspect to it as well. Um, but it's really fun. I do recommend watching it, but I just, I don't know. I wish that these shows would get like just a few more episodes. Yeah. Do you think that that. that's Netflix or do you also think that it's people's like attention spans that they can't last 22 episodes anymore? No, I, I, my husband and I vastly disagree on this, but (laughs) he, he, so he's someone who's like, he doesn't want to sit down for a three hour movie. And I get that sometimes I don't either. Right. Yeah, but we'll binge seven or eight episodes of a TV show. <laughs> and and to his point, he's like, well, but that's different. I know that I can pause it or I know that I can stop when I want to or whatever. Right. So I do think that like. I do think that it's a Netflix thing because so many people I have seen who are either on a Netflix show or worked on it or whatever are saying, like, please binge this the night it comes out. Please watch all of it when it comes out. Otherwise, it's not seen as a success. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Right? Like and a financial or a critical or a whatever success. Right. So they're yeah. like, they want you to binge and watch all of it. Um, like I have a friend, uh, my friend Hamish Steele. He had a cartoon on Netflix. And I couldn't binge all of it at once. But I put it on while while I went to sleep so that it would play. Just so that it would help like the numbers. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, so I think that kind of... I don't know. I don't, I don't really like it. (laughs) I think that, um, they, they want to put, I think that what it is, is an, is I, and I don't know, but I would assume that it's Netflix, like not wanting to put up more money to make a bigger show. Cause they don't want to risk that it might not do well. Right. That's what I think. All the streaming studios, prime Hulu, they, they're not willing to commit to the yeah. show itself and so they say okay give us just eight episodes but give me a break like the one piece show like was number one in like what like 50 countries or something mm-hmm. so you're telling me that you can't do a 12 episode season two give right. me a break right but i don't have much hope for that when i think stranger things is still like an eight episode thing or maybe it's not i don't remember but what they do now is i remember um they did this with Hamish's show, uh, Dead End. They did this with Sabrina. Like, they will film an entire season of a show, which is actually, uh, like, tw- 
for them, I think like 12, 14 episodes. Mm -hmm. And then they will cut it in half and release the first half as season one. Right. Uh, And then, you know, right. And then what they did with Stranger Things was that they cut up, I think that's what they did with the last season. They cut it up and then they released the first half in like, I don't know, June or something. And then in August released the rest of it. So the, I don't understand the way it's made nowadays. And, I can kind and of get that though. That's kind of like what network TV does. Yeah, that's fine. I, I can. I would. I would prefer that to yeah. like cutting it up into two seasons and making people wait for a long time. Yeah, it's like true. you've got those episodes in the can. Just like let us see them. <laughs> I don't know. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I watched the Three Body Problem. It was good. I've also watched um, all of Shogun. Okay. I tried which is that. on Hulu. Mm-hmm. It's it's definitely a I can't be you know, I can't be doing anything else when I am watching it. <laughs> <laughs> Cuz I don't speak <laughs> Japanese. Um so it's definitely it's definitely a you got to read this show most of this show and it's very political and kind of layered and whatever. I you know, I just kind of enjoy the beautiful scenery and costumes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I and I want the 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 female lead to like finally get to kick more butt. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much what I've been watching on, on TV is, is that I, I also started a show on Apple plus. Um, I fell asleep during it, not cause it wasn't great. Cause I was really tired, but it's a new show starring Kristen Wiig nice. and it's called Palm Royale. Mm-hmm. The best way I can describe it is what I saw someone, I saw someone write on, I think on Twitter. Um, it's they said if a show had the tone of screen queens with the pacing of the gilded age that would be pop right now <laughs> but i mostly wanted to watch it because i knew that carol burnett was in it too and i am one of those oh, gays <laughs> so Very yeah cool. um it's it's kind of like a you know like a soapy desperate housewives in palm beach kind of thing um with a really weird tone. I mean, it's okay. Kristen Wiig, so, you know. <laughs> That's pretty much it. You know, of course, I'm always watching Drag Race and all that and whatever, and there's always like 10,000 versions of that on TV. <laughs> so. I, I was going to bring that up because I, I, Danny's not a, a viewer of Drag Race, so I don't get to talk to Drag Race on Pop Cold Deck. So, <laughs> I'll um, see myself how, <laughs> Sorry, Danny. <laughs> we'll call you when we're done. <laughs> uh, what, how, how have you, what have you thought about this season? Are, are you liking it, loving it? Is it okay? I like it a lot. I think it's fun. I do tend to like, see, I, I know a lot of people don't care for this sometimes, but I really love when they have a season where there's a lot of, make this outfit out of garbage <laughs> kind of yeah. challenges you know like those are fun to me those are like creative and interesting you get to see who who really kind of shines in those moments um yeah i think that uh you can kind of see where per- drag race i think is very produced like very very produced they i read and it was told by someone who was on the show that before you go they have you photograph all of your looks because they send you a list of like, bring like this kind of inspired look and bring like a, this kind of look. So they have you photograph them all and send them in advance. Yeah. So it's always weird to me when like for a couple of weeks, they're like, Oh, we don't really think that, you know, you're like not up to snuff. We don't really like what you're wearing, whatever. And then the next week they're like, see, this is what I'm talking about. This you really, it's like, they brought that from home. <laughs> what do you? All of a sudden you think that they like, what like got better like no they had always had that um so that's kind of weird to me but then also um that tells me that production can go oh this queen actually has the best looks and this is a tv show so maybe we keep her around longer so that the Uh runways are amazing if this one queen doesn't have you know her looks are kind of busted Eh. so if we want we can construct that where let's have the first three or four runways be like all of her busted looks so that we can be like, yeah, you're not really doing that well. You know what I mean? Like I could make drag. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I, I think, I think that, I think they try to control as much as they can, but obviously there's stuff that just happens and that's great too. Um, I am kind of team Nymphia. I think mm. she's, you're, you're going to, 
yeah, just let me. <laughs> <laughs> but I made I made this because I was so inspired by her. Oh, nice! <laughs> but it's this like nymphia puppet that I don't know. <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, um, <clears throat> that's awesome. <laughs> but uh, I make puppets now, guys. That's what the pandemic did to me. Um, but but yeah, I think that in this uh, last week, with I guess without spoiling too much or whatever, if you've seen last week, yeah. It was very clear to me that like they wanted a specific queen gone because of the song they chose for them to lip sync to. And so. It kind of reminds me of back when Jinx was facing off with Detox, and they, and they played, changed that. Uh, they changed that song last minute. Yeah, and it was, it was supposed like, to be a different song. Once the music plays, you're like, "Oh, Detox is going home." Like it's yeah. obviously they want Jinx to stay on. Um, yeah, it was very much that with this, this, uh, you know, the, that song that they played that they wanted, uh, what Dawn to go home, not that they yeah. wanted her to go home, but you know, that it was sort of stacked against her with that, that s- s- choice of song. I just, I'm still a little upset that we finally got Sarah Michelle Geller as a guest judge on Drag Race. And there wasn't one single joke or acknowledgement about Dawn. Cause yeah. Dawn was the name of Buffy's little sister. <laughs> they could have yeah. like really... I don't know. Anyway, um, do you have a favorite this season? Um, I think I, I do like Nymphia a lot. This is probably the one of the few seasons where I don't have someone that I'm like totally in love with that I'm just like, God, I hope they win. Um, I, I thought that Dawn ha- actually had some potential. I really like some of her looks. I like people that are sort of stray from what we've kind of seen before or seen a lot. Um, but, um, uh, I think Safira is, is, is kind of, uh, uh, in the running to, to make it to the end. And I think she, <clears throat> is, she, she just seems like a really good person. Um, yeah. they, I know that that's part of the editing, but she seems like she's a really nice, kind person. And that makes me like her even more. Yeah. I, I mean, some of her runway looks have had me like with my jaw on the floor in terms of like, how did. How do you fit that in a suitcase? Because <laughs> like, like, so many of her silhouettes are huge. Like right. you know, she wore like a huge pumpkin one. She wore like a huge ball gown thing. Like it, it was interesting for me to. So there's this other drag competition show that I watch on YouTube that they film in Mexico City and it's called La Mas Draga. And they give those queens like three months to prepare. So the looks they bring are elaborate and huge and insane and crazy. Also, a lot of those queens, not all of them, but a lot of those queens are also from Mexico City. So when you don't have to like pack all your drag Mm -hmm. into like what, four or five suitcases, you can bring a lot more. You can, you know, um, and they give the drag race girls like three weeks. And so there's never there's not usually like huge, elaborate kind of crazy stuff. So that's why I don't know. Safira was just like ready somehow. (laughs) So, yeah. Well, and you you mentioned something earlier that that I I wanted to to also mention um, the sort of project runway ish uh, you know contest where they have to do the unconventional challenges where they're making costumes out of whatever trash or toys or whatever. Um, I love those as well because I I feel like it it evens the playing field and maybe people the girls that don't have the most elaborate or you know, don't have the budget to bring in these great gowns or pay these designers to make them these really cool gowns are really creative and they can make things out of, you know, trash. And um, I don't know, I just, I, I, it may, I'm a really big fan of like club kids from like the nineties. Mm-hmm. And it, I, I have always really liked seeing people make extraordinary things out of the mundane or, you know, the ordinary um, and that kind of reminds me of that sort of aesthetic in, in that. Time. Yeah. Um, and so I always, <laughs> and, and if you're busted and don't know how to make something, just be nice and Safira will do it for you. <laughs> <laughs> right. <Yeah>, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that is true. Yeah. There, I, we, we can move on, but I just want to say that I am also watching Drag Race UK versus the world. And my favorite queen on there is like kicking ass and she's so good. And her lip syncs have been insane. And amazing. And I think it was uh, Joel Kim Booster. He tweeted, I'm going to need to watch Drag Race Philippines now because who the hell beat this queen? Right. <laughs> like, so she's really great. Her name's Marina Summers, but she's my favorite queen on there and she's so good. Nice. I, I haven't drawn Drag Race girls in a while and I did draw her. 
my Instagram. <laughs> Nice. Uh, one last drag race topic and then we'll we'll move on. But um, it's been reported that Michelle Visage is going to be the new host of uh, Drag Race Australia or Down Under or whatever, you, uh, you know, that iteration. Um, but then I saw something that said that um, that she may not because there's been some pushback from the community saying that a non drag queen should be not you know shouldn't be hosting a drag race competition do you th i i kind of don't feel that way i think that she's sort of proven herself as an ally and like really knowledgeable in the drag race realm um so i don't have any uh you know i, I i'm not opposed to her being a host um i think she'd be really good on it by herself but i don't know what do you think can can someone who's just an ally who's been involved in the drag race world be a legitimate host or should it be someone that is involved by actually being a drag queen? I don't remember what um, international franchise it was. Maybe it was Italy. I'm not sure. But I think one of the hosts was just like a queer celebrity mm -hmm. and wasn't really a drag queen. But like there's a team of people that put him in drag for every episode. Yeah. So that person wasn't a drag queen either. I've seen Michelle Visage out of out of her makeup. <laughs> She's a beautiful woman in and out of her makeup. But she gets up in drag for Drag Race. I'm sorry, but she's wearing wigs. She has a team of people doing her makeup. Like, I don't know. Like, I, again, it's kind of the X-Men 97 thing. Like, I just don't. I understand that the representation, and that's important. And couldn't they find an Australian queen? And Courtney acts like sitting right over here like, okay, fuck my drag. But, you know... I don't know. Just like, who cares? We all know Michelle. We, you know, she's done the show. She's been there. And I think it's fine. Like, that's just me. But I think it's fine. Um, plus, if they, how do I say this? If they have Michelle be the host, and then they keep Reese as a judge, mm -hmm. but the other judge is like a rotating, like, famous Australian queen, that's great too. Cause then you get to have a lot of Australian Queens on the show um, or Queens from New Zealand. Um, so that could be fun too, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, give it a chance, see what it's like before, before you judge it, you know, I guess. Um, but I'm fine with it. Like, I don't know. Michelle's cool. She takes her kids to Comic-Con <laughs> or she did when, when they were younger, I guess, but yeah, she's like an anime nerd mom. So that's cool. Uh, Danny, what did, what did you watch? Uh, well, I've been on a a Alan Tudyk tear recently. <laughs> <laughs> so I watched. I found a came across a series he did. A, I think a few years back called Con Man, where he plays a um, basically almost like his character from Firefly. Um, Nathan Fillion's in it as well. It was a web series that they released on Prime, and each episode is like 10, 12 minutes. So it's really short, so I was just watching a bunch of them. But basically, he pays an actor in a, from a sci-fi series who wants to be known for more than just that role. So he doesn't want to be typecast. But now, also going to the conventions, why it's called Con Man, um, he is embraced by that community of that show. And so he's torn between you know wanting to be there to celebrate that role with those with the audience there but also wanting to be more than just that role so it's a really cool show i really enjoyed it and i also stumbled across resident alien mm -hmm. which is really fun show they have been advertising that to me every time i log into like hulu or whatever <laughs> like you would not believe like it pops up every time yeah it's it's really good i, I started it i'm in like four episodes in now in season one it's really fun it's uh, I guess it's also based on a graphic novel or a comic book series as well. So it's a really cool show. Um, he plays an alien who shapeshifts into a human and then he has to assume that human identity. And it's it's really fun. I, I think it's comical. It's, I think he's just a very um, clever actor. Alan is with the, his mannerisms and his attempts to become human and not be an alien. It's really fun, really enjoyable, really comical. It's a great cast. I, I'm really liking it. I really became a fan of his. I don't know if you guys remember um, that movie with Sandra Bullock. Where, I was just going to say 28 uh, Days. <laughs> yeah, like we, I thought, I don't know, like I loved him since that movie, like his character. He plays, I, I think, what is he, German or something in, in the film? And um, he just has like a German accent and kind of like lispy and um, is an alcoholic and uh i don't know i i fell in love with the character and i fell in love with him as an actor um from then but a big fan since since that movie 
I think there's like I think his thing is that he's also that movie is like about people in rehab and that he was like I, I would, couldn't have a relationship or I couldn't take care of a dog or whatever and they're like just start with a plant yeah <laughs> start with a plant and then I think like towards the end of the movie she sees him out somewhere buying a plant and it's like funny and sweet or whatever um I love that movie I've watched it many times but I would always mix up the title with the zombie movie 20 days later <laughs> and then it, somehow in my mind i started like doing this with them and that is um sort of the inspiration for a book i'm pitching this year <laughs> nice very cool <laughs> it's, it's 28 days means 28 days later <laughs> so it's it's about a female zombie who gets drunk and ruins her sister's wedding it might be about well it's just kind of somewhat inspired by but so far what i'm working with is like a few people who are in re are, are in rehab when like the rapture happens. <laughs> oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> <clears throat> I, I feel like the rapture. It, it there are like the Christian movies that deal with the rapture, like Left Behind and all the like Kirk Cameron stuff. But it, it's I I feel like there'd be a really cool topic for like mainstream movies to go into I, I was raised really not really religious but religious and it was always like something like really scary for me like the end times and the antichrist and all of that stuff and i'm like why haven't they made a movie with that but like make it scary not make it like christiany and yeah that's so that's what i want to do because i'm yeah. i'm i was raised mormon right and i was a mormon missionary and i am not religious i am not spiritual <laughs> not who i am and i i love the idea of like everybody disappearing except for a few people yeah and someone being like oh this is okay whatever i don't know what happened and someone else being like obviously this is the rapture another other person being like dude that's not a real thing <laughs> yeah. like yeah so yeah, I love that idea too. I, that's exactly what you're saying is exactly the kind of tone I want is that like, it doesn't have to be that kind of thing. And if people disappeared, who's to say it is the rapture? What if it's something? What if it's, I can't give it away. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> one of the best takes in like one of my favorite episodes is um, I don't know if you watch American Dad, but they did a oh. rapture episode and it was so good. There was like, a false Jesus that Stan thinks is Jesus and does some things to try to like get on his good side. <laughs> so, it's so awesome. I, I am someone who watches so much American dad that I just call that show Roger now. And <laughs> now I'll be like, I'm going to, I'll tell my husband, I'm going to put on Roger and go to bed so much to the point where like, I, I don't know if this will be a video podcast or whatever but like i have this book i drew of like different drag looks that roger's wearing oh my god it's like this oh, is RuPaul. Awesome. <laughs> here's him as britney um here's him as like frida and winifred sanderson <laughs> because roger's characters are 99 percent original like they're not he doesn't dress up in drag as like existing characters right that's the funny aspect of it um so yeah, I, I love that. And my thing is, because I also love the Orville, which is um, yeah. Seth MacFarlane's um, like basically owed to TNG, right? Mm -hmm. And my thing I want, because there is a character who um, was voiced by Norm MacDonald, RIP, who was like computer animated. He's like this gl glob of green slime. And so I just want, just once, if that show ever comes back, for like a CGI Roger to be walking around in the background of the spaceship, I think it would be amazing. So I also drew him in like an Orville uniform. Just awesome. like, <laughs> anyway, yes, I, yes, I watch American Dad. <laughs> Can people but, buy those anywhere, Terry? Cause I would like um, to get that. I'll send you one. Yeah. I have a few made. I'm going to be making a few more and I will have them at, um, flame con, which I'm doing this summer in August. And also, um, I don't know. I might be doing a show in Boise this summer, but I'll send you one. <laughs> Thanks. Right on. <laughs> yeah, one of my my favorite characters or or, or uh, bits that Roger does is when he's pregnant and he's like wanting he's like begging Haley to like give him a little bit of meth and he's like just a teeny teeny piece of meth. <laughs> I so love awesome. my my favorite kind of storyline is when he starts he's like so stressed out that he starts to get this like tumor but then it like <laughs> becomes like a little homunculus that separates from him. Yeah. Um. 
there was a contest guys i'm sorry this is a tangent there was a contest not long ago where it was like design roger's next character and if you win like maybe we'll put it on the show or whatever so like i entered it twice and i did not win (laughs) but one of (laughs) one of them was his name's his name's augustine lebeau and he's a child beauty pageant coach who's like a chain smoker and his little like pageant girl is his is grogu his like little homunculus (laughs) this was like my anyway anyway and then also basil pennyfeather who's like a peacock trainer was my other submission but but they didn't like it i guess (laughs) those are awesome those are awesome (laughs) yeah i love him he's my he's my dream guest judge for drag race yeah, <laughs> that that would be amazing. That that would be like a crossover that would just blow my mind away. Absolutely, so good. I w- I died when Miss Piggy was on. Yeah, I had been saying for years that she was my dream guest judge, and she did just do like a little video thing. But still, anyway, Miss Piggy was like one of my original like icons from childhood. I had the Miss Piggy in like a purple felt like dress, and it was kind of it was a controversial issue in my family because. After a certain age, they were like, do we allow Gabriel to have a Miss Piggy basically doll? Um, because you, she had like long hair and like a dress. And eventually it it the vote was we need to get rid of this. <laughs> 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 but I was like obsessed with Miss Piggy. Like I it, she was like everything to me until I was like, like I, I don't know, I probably was like five or six at the time. And uh, yeah, so but it was the family decided it was not not meant to be <laughs> the Muppet. Mo- the only Muppet movie I want is a, a Muppet murder mystery mm-hmm. <laughs> like where they're like uh, that has the tone of like Clue or like even kind of like Rocky Horror where they're like in a mansion and yep. it's like someone gets murdered. I don't know. It'd be really <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Tim Curry would work great, too. Mm hmm. Yep. <laughs> well, so, well, one of the other movies that I saw, uh, just to to bring up uh, another topic, uh, if you will, is uh, the new Ghostbusters movie. I don't know if you guys saw that or um, if you're you're uh, interested in watching it. It was uh, Frozen Empire. <laughs> it's like the I don't know, like the fourth, fifth one. You saw you saw it already? Yeah, yeah. It was really good. We we saw it on like I guess premiere night or whatever. My husband's like a really big Ghostbusters fan. So we went. I didn't know it was out already. Yeah. Yeah. It's out. (laughs) It it was really good. It's like, it's really cute. It's like, um, it has a really good plot. Like it has all like the original, not all, but the surviving Ghostbusters are, are all in it. And, um, it's, it's a really good film. Like it, it centers around, uh, the same young girl character. I forget her name. Um, but, she it sort of centers around her and she befriends uh another female ghost that's her age teenage ghost and they sort of it's not like overtly lesbian but like it's kind of implied that yeah. they're having like this love affair um and and it, it was kind of cool to see that because that's something that we don't get to see um in mainstream films like a lot so that was kind of cool plus like ghost and slimers in it and um they have like throwbacks to a lot of the old ghosts that you've seen in other ghostbusters so it was really fun it was a really fun movie cool yeah i recommend it for sure i haven't watched it yet i've heard um either you hate it or you love it so it's really been the very divisive i think which is weird i mean ghostbusters is a great franchise why would you hate on it right so i want to see it i'm looking forward to it another um something i watched that also was really divisive i think was the new roadhouse movie oh Oh, really yeah (laughs) i watched that i did like it i mean um i liked gyllenhaal's um quirkiness in it and he is the way he plays um the dalton character and i will preface that it took me 34 years to watch the original roadhouse with patrick swayze i never watched it until probably last year and then i saw this on night one that it was released just because it was there (laughs) so but i enjoyed it i mean i like the fight scenes in it i like the the grit of it and i thought it was just i think it was well done i enjoyed it let me tell you an amazing double feature is roadhouse followed by two Wong Fu. thanks for everything julie newmar yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a great patrick Sw- it's a great patrick swacy double marathon i was just gonna say his his best role was in two Wong Fu for sure like 
that that like he does such an iconic like all three of them actually do such a perfect yeah. job it's, it's crazy to watch blade and then watch that too <laughs> <laughs> there you go <laughs> i think it's like you watch roadhouse blade super mario brothers and then, and then you then watch that and, and see all yeah. three of them transform <clears throat> and then john linguizamo i think is brilliant in that movie too he's mm. he's so funny yeah but, uh, yeah i i didn't watch roadhouse i wasn't a really big action uh patrick swayze fan like i but um i i'm a fan of jake gyllenhaal um i like him so um conor mcgregor i think is in it as well right yeah well he he plays the he's a smaller well not smaller role but he's like the main villain i guess you would say okay and he's getting a spin off from it from what i hear he's getting what a spin off oh is he oh yeah i can see that because the end um cut scene i guess if you will the end kind of could lead into that yeah 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 for some reason people are really upset about this movie i don't know if it's because they hold patrick swayze in such high regard that like how dare they remake a movie that he was in um i didn't know roadhouse was that like beloved by people that it was like that big of a deal to remake it but apparently right it is the the other film that they're talking about that's getting a lot of heat is the crow remake and they're saying that it shouldn't be touched because yep. uh you know brandon lee died by by yep. making it and and that should stay as his lasting legacy which i i don't really agree with i don't know how you guys feel but um i i think that especially with like that type of character you can reinvent it um over and over again and kind of bring something new to it that wasn't seen before um yeah i i don't know i think i kind of feel the same way but um but yeah i think that a lot of these movies are just banking on the fact that like with roadhouse i'm sure a whole bunch of like 20 year olds went to see it and they have no idea that there was another movie in the 80s Mm -hmm. you know called roadhouse with that they don't know who patrick swayze is (laughs) you know they're on tiktok all day (laughs) unless 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 there's like scenes from ghost on tiktok they don't know (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's true the, yeah. the only thing i'll say about roadhouse that i missed was a, the sam elliott i mean sam mm. elliott made roadhouse for me the original i thought he was great in that and you know his mustache and his gravelly voice i mean <laughs> yeah his mustache <laughs> <laughs> that's most of sam elliott <laughs> exactly yeah, that's like 99 percent of, of him <laughs> um well i i did watch uh just trying to move us forward here i did watch a documentary believe it or not because i'm not a huge documentary person but i did watch one uh about frida that was premiered on prime and it was it was fascinating documentary because it was there was actors doing the voices but all the words from it came from her i guess diaries or anything so it was all told in her words and they also had some colorized video of her and Diego Rivera. So it was really fascinating to see. And I, I really enjoyed that. And the reason I bring that up is because Terry, you have a new book out about Frida. So I want to go ahead and, and get into that a little bit and and tell us first off, how did you get to write this book about Frida? Um I previously wrote a book for Who HQ Graphic um through Penguin um about the about Cesar Chavez. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when I wrote that book, I I was a little hesitant to do it because I'd never written anything about a person who actually had lived like a real person. Right. Um, and I just I was like farm labor union stuff. But for kids, like what? I don't think like, it didn't sound appealing <laughs> to me. But I was like, you know, the more I thought about it, I was like, you know, kids understand the difference between right and wrong. Like, you know, you're not treating me fair. And so I was like, well, that could be an interesting like challenge. And I don't want to pass that up. So I did that book. Um, the editor on that book was fantastic. And like, I had a great time working with that editor. So when they decided to do another set of books, um, she messaged me and was like, hey, do you have interest in doing another book? And I was like, I guess it just depends on who it would be. And I think she knew exactly what she was doing because she was like, well, like, um, what do you think about like Michael Jordan? I was like, girl, no, not unless it's about Space Jam. And then she was like, okay, like Marie Antoinette. I was like, "Mm, maybe. And she's like, okay, what about Frida? And I was like, oh, sure. Yeah, I'll do that. (laughs) Um, And I mean, I have always liked Frida and her artwork. And um, 
and her paintings. And I obviously studied some of them in art school. And I do think that she, like, I would even, um, I guess, at least in America, I think she is way more widely known than Diego Rivera's work, even. Like, Diego throughout Mexico and Mexico City, his murals and everything. Like, he he was it. He was yeah. the guy. Um, <clears throat> and um, because she's such a prominent, famous Mexican artist, and I think, in my opinion, probably the most famous female artist of all time, <laughs> yeah. um, I was like, yeah, I kind of want to write this. I also had gone to Frida's house, the Casa Azul in Mexico City, and taken a bunch of pictures. There were a bunch of things in um, her house that I saw that, like a diorama she had made with like skeletons and alligators and stuff. I was like, this is cool. I didn't know that she also made like dioramas and stuff. And I love making crafty things with my hands too. Um, so I felt like, yeah, I'd already started my research. Like, sure, right? Um, the other thing that appealed to me about the book was that um, with this one and the Cesar Chavez book, the editor w was like, you know, we don't want you to write, you know, they were born, they did this stuff, they died. End of story. Like, pick what you think is the most um, interesting kind of part of their life or point in their life and write about that. And so I thought about it real hard. <laughs> and I was reading a bunch about her. I had a couple books about her. Um, and I was researching stuff online. There was an amazing video essay um, by this fashion historian that was really helpful as well. Um, but I, the more I read about her, the more I realized, you know, she was known as Senora Rivera. She was known as Diego's wife. Mm -hmm. And when she got the opportunity to, when she was offered her first solo show in New York City mm -hmm. during the Great Depression, and she considered like not doing it. She was just like, I don't know. I don't really like the U S <laughs> you know, like, yeah. um, but I, she knew at this point that Diego was very unfaithful to her. And I, I think she realized that if she sold these paintings, it would mean financial independence. Mm -hmm. And that also it would give her the opportunity to not be known as Diego's wife and to have, to be known as Frida Kahlo. So I was like, that seems interesting to me. Also, the idea of um, like when when we see movies about the Great Depression, everything is like brown and gray. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah. Frida, her clothes were super colorful and elaborate and whatever. So the idea of her walking down the street in New York when, with, you know, people in New York with like brown and gray clothes and her in this like colorful kind of look, I thought was a striking image. It was it was almost like flipping what we are familiar with in American cinema when they make movies about Mexico, right? Yeah. Like the brown sepia tone, whatever, when Mexico is actually beautiful and colorful and, you know. So anyway, yeah, I wrote that book. Um, it was a fun challenge. Um, the artwork is by Ashanti Fortson. Um, they did a great job. And if you um, look closely at the beginning of the book, um, Frida is making that diorama <laughs> that, that, nice. um, that I saw. So she's doing that in the first scene. Um, but yeah, it, it doesn't shy away from the fact that she, you know, was also in love with this photographer, Nicholas Murray. Um, Georgia O'Keefe was a good friend of hers, came to her art show. Um, and yeah, it kind of talks about some of her reviews that she got in that show. And um, a Paris a show like an art show in Paris that she was offered that went horribly yeah. awry. Um, but yeah, I, I um, didn't realize so much when I started a lot of my research that she was also like, I mean, she was bisexual, but she was also biracial, bicultural. So there's a lot of these like duality kind of things where her um, mom was indigenous from Mexico and her father was like German. Mm -hmm. And so that felt close to me as well. I was like, oh, well, my dad's like, you know, his ancestry is white European and my mom's like, she, she's straight up like Aztec Indian, like, right. Um, and so I liked the idea of incorporating um, the idea that she embraces 
embraces both of the things she is instead of segmenting herself out. It sounds weird, but like she she always thought of herself as like kind of broken and in pieces, right? And so I think her embracing the idea of being more than one thing instead of breaking down was interesting. But anyway, <laughs> that's what I did. It's <laughs> it's actually called Who Was Her Own Work of Art? Frida Kahlo. Um, because the, the Who HQ graphic novel series, um, their titles are all questions and then the name of the person. But that's that's the book. Nice. Very cool. Very yeah. Cool. Thank you. I had a list of questions, but like you answered most of them right there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to ask you, Terry, it, it, for people that are watching that that are creatives, that are, are writers or creators, um, that get that are afraid to sort of tackle big stories or big themes um how do you have not be intimidated by you know obviously you're you're writing about someone who is a feminist <clears throat> icon a mexican icon i mean the list goes on and on for our, you know how important she is to a vast uh lar- you know a very large community and various communities um how does how do you get to the point where that inspires you versus you know l- making that kind of scare you um i mean that's a really good question i think there's a couple things that you can do i i am someone who has a slight fear of um reading a review that's like um actually that's not what this person said and this this writer got it wrong because this and this was the year that you know i do have that fear so (laughs) instead of letting that like overpower me I do as much as I can in terms of like research and making myself an expert at whatever it is I'm writing about. I don't think I'm a Frida expert, but I feel like I almost became an expert on this part of her life, which I was writing about. Um, And I think the preparation, like people ask me all the time how long it takes to write a graphic novel or how long it takes to write a comic. The actual script writing uh, for me, is one of the fastest things. It's all of the preparation and the research and the creating the story and the synopsis and all of that, putting all that together. So while you're doing that, you can like, you know, amend things and go, oh, I got that wrong and cross that out and then move stuff around. And, you know, <clears throat> um, I think just doing the like hard preparation and dedicating yourself to that will help alleviate a lot of the the worry and the stress. Um, when I did the Cesar Chavez book, um, I asked the editor, cause I did have that fear too. I was like, I, you know, I'm writing a scene of him, you know, speaking to, you know, some people at night, like, I don't, I don't want to get it wrong. Like what, you know, like, I don't know if he actually said these words and she was like, make it up. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> She's like, just make it up. And I was like, you know, she wasn't being blase about it or whatever, yeah. but her, what she, you know, she explained a bit more. She's getting at was like, well, you weren't there. Right. It was like, yeah. And she's like, okay, only the people in that scene were the people that were actually there. So some reviewer can't be like, well, that's not what he said. Cause they don't know either. <laughs> like, you know, and, and if they're like that, he wouldn't have said that that's an opinion. Like that is debatable. Right. Um, So I felt like I had to just sort of get like the vibe and the tone of what, of the way Frida would have said things. Um, She, it's somewhat controversial, but I love it that she had this letter that she wrote to Nicholas Murray um, when she was in Paris. That was like, it was like these fake ass people here and the way that they think they sit in their fancy cafes with their fucking cigarettes. And they just like, talk about art like they think they are it they don't know anything they are so stupid she's like i would rather sit on the floor in a market in mexico selling tortillas for the rest of my life than be here with these people (laughs) so awesome because i'm just gonna say this because i think and you know i've never been to france i don't know paris i don't know france anything but i do think that in america we are fed the idea that Paris and France is like fancy and ooh and beautiful and pretty, right? Mexico, ooh, gross, yeah. kind of dirty. I don't know, dangerous. And like to me, the idea of someone who's like, this is my home. It's beautiful. I love it. And that does not appeal to me. 
going what I've been told is no, I have no interest in that. I thought that was real badass. <laughs> so yeah. I love that aspect of it. For instance, um, one of my favorite little kind of nuggets of trivia about Frida was that um, she had a pet fawn, like a baby deer. Um, I think its name was like Granizo or Grani or something like that. I don't remember. But when people see that photo of her with the deer, mm -hmm. you know, people have been like, oh, how exotic, how interesting she has this deer, this like animal that people usually don't, whatever. Audrey Hepburn also had a pet fawn and people are like, Ooh, how sweet, how cute, how, you know, they don't call her exotic. They don't yeah. call her. You know. So I had made sure that the, that the deer was in the book. Cause I love that. <laughs> so it's in like the very last, it's in like the very last page, I think like sleep. Yeah. Sleeping at her feet um, nice. as she's painting. Um, but yeah, I just like, I wanted to kind of challenge some of those, you know, perceptions I think that people have about, art and culture and whatever. And so hopefully I was able to do it, but I guess that's up to the reader. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of the I, reader, what, what do you think is like the main message you want the, the reader to take away from this book? Um, I think the main message, the sort of theme of the book was um, that you, that if you embrace the qualities that, that you have, instead of um instead of being afraid of them or rejecting them if you embrace who you are essentially that who you are can inspire you to make like you know frida's frida's main subject of her work was herself yeah so i thought that was really interesting and i think something that i'm asked quite a bit when i speak to um illustration students in colleges and whatnot they a, a lot of times ask me like how I get inspired. And my response is usually like, I don't have time for that. <laughs> and they're like, what? Like, they're, huh? And I'm like, you know, I don't like go to a cafe, get my little cup of coffee and my sketch pad and sit there and go, inspire me. <laughs> like, you know, look up to the heavens and wait. That's not how it works. Like the more dedicated and motivated that you are, the more you work, the more you'll be inspired the more things you're going to be watching or exposing yourself to or reading. And those are the things that give you a better sense of who you are. And those are the things that inspire you, I think, to like come up with stories and make work. So I think that would be what I want people to take away from it. And, and that, that does make the title of the book, you know, very appropriate. I think yeah. like who was her own work of art. So yeah. yeah. Very cool. Speaking of of inspiration and or you know how you you draw on things, um, what are you working on that you can tell us about, or what what else do you have coming <clears throat> out uh, that we can look forward to? So, I am I well, my co writer Maddie Newton and I have completed the second volume script uh, for a book called Eat Your Heart Out, and the first volume of that book comes out in August. Um, you can Google, you know, Maddie Newton, Terry Blast, eat your heart out and it will come up. There is a CBR article um, that talked about the book. Um, it is also a book about a young Latina in New York City with an art show, <laughs> 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 which, I did, which I did not realize is like, you know, I don't I don't get to choose when my books come out. Right. <laughs> like it just happened. But um, I may have spoken to you about it once before, but. It's a project I've had for a long time. Um, it's being published by Oni Press. But um, the story is essentially this you know, young Mexican-American girl, also biracial, white dad, Mexican mom. I tend to write about that a lot. Um, she graduates high school in Idaho, and she wants to go into fashion. But her mom, Reina, wants her to um, go into business. So she runs away and drives across the country and ends up in New York, where she moves in with seven gay guys. <laughs> And um, her mom then sends a private investigator after her. So it's essentially like a Mexican modern day retelling of like Snow White. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and like, but but not just that, like the whole inspiration is fairy tales. There's other scenes that are inspired by like Cinderella, the Little Mermaid, like uh, Wizard of Oz, you know. Um, Very cool. And yeah, I just really wanted to do a book that was a love letter to like um, 
not only like the queer community, because they're not she doesn't move in with seven gay guys, like they're they are seven queer people. Um, and you'll get to see like the different co- sort of like personalities and layers of this ensemble. But um more than that, I wanted to also do a book that was a love letter to the New York City that I knew when I lived there, um, in a way, like the people that I knew. Um, because if I think about the most famous piece of media that we have about New York. I think it's probably the sitcom Friends. Mm. But when I lived in New York, I didn't know like any white people, (laughs) you know, so there had to be Puerto Ricans and Dominicans and, you know, trans people and black people and queer people. And so that's what this book is. Um, And I'm very proud of it. I'm excited for it to come out um, in, I believe, mid-August. So, yeah. Very cool. It's August is my birthday month, so I have something to buy. All right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. There's yeah, a lot of there's a lot to buy of, it for um, me and give it to me as a birthday gift, like you know. <laughs> the editor in chief at Oni um, said in that article, she was like, you know, for fans of the Great British Bake Off, Project Runway, and RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> yeah, one of the characters, one of the characters is a baker. So like, eat your heart out with like baking, but then also like indulge in yourself. Also, like the apple and Snow White eat your, and I mean, uh, the heart and Snow White is what the queen eats. So, you know, eat your heart out. Yeah. Very cool. I'm well, yeah. looking forward to that. Um, let's see. Is there anything else that you want to get off your chest while you're here on, on Pop Cult X? Um, I would say also check out Chispa Comics. Um, I've been doing covers for their um, sort of like origin stories for their superheroes there. Oh, cool. Um, there's 13 of those. And, um, I believe it has been announced that, um, those 13 superheroes will be coming together for their own mini series of six issues, um, of which I am writing. Um, but I was like 13, some of those are going to like Star Trek style, take a back seat. <laughs> <laughs> we can't focus on all 13. Um, I've written five of those so far, so I just have uh, the one left to to write. But um, yeah, check out Chispa Comics too, because uh, a few of those origin stories are already out for people to to read. Nice. Yeah, you mentioned think... that you're going to be at a couple of conventions uh, coming up. Um, which ones again? Where, where we will? So uh, I the... should be going to ALA, the American Library Association conference. Um, I believe that's in June in San Diego. Um, I usually do the Boise Library Comic Show every August. Um, or I think this year it was this past year was in September. Um, but I will be at FlameCon, which is in New York in August. Uh FlameCon is, I believe, the weekend of like the 21st, 22nd. Um, Eat Your Heart Out is supposed to come out like the day after that. So I'll have books, um, like copies of it there. It'll probably debut at that show. But it's a show in New York, so and it's a queer show in New York. There you so, go. <laughs> yeah, very cool, yeah, awesome. very cool. Well, Terry, thanks for taking some time to chat with us today here at Pop Culture X. We always appreciate when you come on the show to deliver us your insightful takes on all things pop culture. And of course, everyone out there, be sure to go follow Terry on all social medias. Um, pick up his books, especially the new ones that are coming out. Um, yeah, anything else, Gabe? Uh, no, so where where can we find your books? Just on Amazon, um, your website? Um, if you go to my website, you can see all of my books. Um, they There are links for you, you to click on, which I believe most of them link to Amazon, but you can also get them um, from like your local comic shop or any bookstore. We'll probably order them for you. Cool. There you go. Well, thank you again, everyone, for tuning in, for liking, sharing. Thanks again to Terry for stopping by, and we will see you all next time. Stay safe, everyone.